living in this world feels so hard right now. Do y'all agree with me? That living in this world feels so hard right now. It seems like mostly everyone is dealing with some degree of depression and anxiety. Fires and hurricanes and flooding are destroying our homes and our lives. COVID-19 has taken loved ones from us, disrupted our lives, forced many into severe poverty and suffering. Racism of our past and our present is wreaking havoc on people of color across our world. People are addicted and broken and tired and suffering. And now they have even fewer places to go for help and support. Do y'all agree with me? Living in this world is so hard right now. So many people of different faiths and walks of life have carried this prophetic torch, shining their light, proclaiming that it doesn't have to be this way, that another world is possible, that life and flourishing and peace are within our reach. They've been saying it and proclaiming it and working towards it, yet any progress that seems to be made, it seems to be met too often with powerful opposition and backlash. You know, we've been taught this vision of our world that the world is slowly moving in the right direction, progressing onward and upward towards something good and something beautiful. Yet to me, that doesn't often seem to be true. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know, but it certainly doesn't seem to be true sometimes. It feels like history often moves more in waves, where we make progress and we move towards equality and love, but then there's strong backlash that sets us back. You know, regardless of how history works, the empire's way of power and violence and control seems to always have the final say. You know, the Thessalonian Christians faced many hardships and many struggles. Their decision to follow Jesus in his way put them in direct conflict with their neighbors and the powerful who followed the emperor in the Roman way. Honestly, before they gave their lives to Jesus, life would have been hard probably. Life in the ancient Near East was very difficult for most people. Uh, scholars have argued that potentially over 90% of the people lived in poverty in that part of the world, in that time and place. And that a small percentage, kind of a ruling class, held all the wealth and power. So the Thessalonian Christians, there's a good chance they struggled to get by. And then they started following Jesus, which made life even harder for them. The empire's way of power and violence and control was in their face daily and seemed to be winning. Though there was something about the way Paul described Jesus and the gospel <laughs> that compelled them to say yes to a new way of existing in the world. Something about Jesus and the gospel gave them courage to reject the way of the empire and embrace the way of Jesus. Let's talk about one thing this morning that I know gave them courage and hope. Stacy Long last week wondered in the comments, he said, I wonder why there's so much talk of eschatology in 1 Thessalonians. Some of y'all may have been like, eschatology, what is that? Well, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's an important biblical kind of studies word, and, and it basically means the end times. Eschatology is the study and talk of the end times. So when we're talking about eschatology, uh, we're talking about um, questions like this. What, when will time be fulfilled? Does the world as we know it ever end? What happens when it does end? Does God have an ultimate plan for our world? Will the empires of this world rule forever? Is there anything more than this? These types of questions, eschatology, it's dealt with uh, many times throughout the Bible. There's a lot of discussion of this kind of thing. And these are question, 
Questions really that struggling people grapple with on a regular basis. But these are not questions that privileged, comfortable, powerful people grapple with on a regular basis. Let me break down why that is. In the Bible, there's a genre of literature called apocalyptic literature. All right, I'll put that on the screen. Apocalyptic literature. Y'all maybe have seen apocalyptic movies. Uh, they're kind of about the end times. So there's a genre of, of, of literature in the Bible called apocalyptic literature. And what kind of has its roots in the Old Testament, some Old Testament prophets receive visions of a future day when the world as we know it would be kind of dramatically altered and the heavenly world would collide with the earthly world. And when these two worlds collide, insanity ensues. And usually these visions of this collision of these two worlds, they were very surreal, they were fantastic, they inspired wonder and amazement among the people. We read of dragons and fires and storms and wind and battles. Often a period of chaos is described that eventually ends in a new world order of peace and justice and righteousness. In the Old Testament, the book of Daniel is the best example of apocalyptic literature. Go read the latter part of Daniel and you'll see it gets a little wild, right? It's apocalyptic literature. In the New Testament, Revelation is another great example of this kind of literature. And let me tell you something that is so important, all right? Apocalyptic literature was meant to be encouraging to its readers, not terrifying. We read it today and we're like, this sounds scary, but to them it was supposed to be encouraging. Apocalyptic literature was typically written by those on the bottom of society. It was written and read by the poor and the oppressed and the foreigners. It was written by those who had given up much hope, right, that the system was ever going to work for them. And they often felt like the only thing that could change their circumstance was if God stepped in himself and took on the ruling powers. You know, if you have a secure, comfortable income and health insurance, a nice place to live, and it feels as if you've got to where you are solely on your hard work and talents, if that's your vantage point, then overturning and dismantling and collision and chaos, that sounds like the stuff of nightmares, doesn't it? But think about it. If you've fallen on really hard times, if you're struggling to feed your family, if you can't afford health care, if you can't find a job, if you're drowning in debt, if you're trying to leave your war-torn country and you can't get out, if you're living under oppressive rule, if you've been denied the right to vote and function in society, if that's you, then your reaction to apocalyptic writings might be, hey, can't come a moment too soon. Jesus, Come back as soon as you can because this world ain't working for me. I'm ready for you to turn it upside down. You know, perhaps Paul talks about eschatology and end times so much in 1 Thessalonians because he knew that they were struggling. Paul was struggling. And he knew that it would be encouraging for them to know that though the opposition was so strong, Jesus was stronger and he would return to set things Right. You see, the Thessalonians, well, they were new Christians, all right? And they were practicing a faith that had not been around for very long at all. First Thessalonians is probably the first letter written, or the first work in the entire New Testament. And, and this was new stuff. They, did, they hadn't been reading all the other letters. They didn't know this stuff yet. They believed in Jesus' return. But they truly believed that Jesus was coming back soon. And when I say soon, I mean they thought Jesus would return within their lifetimes before they died. That's what they believed. You can kind of pick up on the clues as you read through the, the letters of Paul. They were ready for the apocalypse. They were ready for change. They were ready to be with Jesus forever. And while they waited for Jesus, some of their friends passed away. And they grieved the loss of their friends and family but they also grew very anxious and concerned, all right? And here's what they were concerned about. When Jesus returns, our friends won't be here because they died. 
what happens to them? You know, for us today, we may think that question sounds absurd. But for the first Christians, that was a real concern. None of the friends that they had in their faith community had died yet. And so Paul gives them some teaching about their friends, but also offers up an apocalyptic vision of when Christ returns to offer them some hope. And let me, let me read this scripture for you. You can follow along. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Paul says, Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. This is our text uh, in the lectionary for this morning. And in this text, Paul makes it clear that since Jesus rose from the dead, the Christians who have died will also rise from the dead. And so he's saying, there ain't no need to worry about your loved ones who have died. You're all going to be with Jesus, all right? Every one of you. And he also speaks about Jesus's return, and that's what I want to focus on. In very vivid imagery, he describes this loud trumpet call from God, this commanding voice of the archangel, and then Jesus descending from heaven in the clouds. Then the believers, both dead and alive, are snatched up by God, and they are with Jesus up in the clouds. And then they will live with God forever, is what he says. Now, a lot of people, they, they spend too much time trying to pick apart all the details of these kinds of stories, and, and they make up things about the rapture and all this kind of stuff. We don't need to, to spend much time trying to decipher exactly what all these details mean. Because in apocalyptic literature, the writers intentionally are using these larger-than-life images to try to describe larger-than-life events. These images were not meant to give all the details, but they were meant to inspire hope and bring comfort to a powerless and suffering people, not describe the specifics of what the event will be like. And so through these powerful and vivid images, Paul assures the Thessalonians that Jesus is powerful and that he is going to return. All right? He assures the Thessalonians that Jesus is powerful and he's going to come back. And when he comes back, He's going to shake everything up and all will be well for them as they live with Jesus forever. And yes, that brings tremendous comfort and hope to those um, that, are experiencing the, that are experiencing distress because they know that what we're experiencing now is not all there is, that things will eventually be made right, that brokenness will be made whole, that love will win, that justice and peace will prevail. What Jesus accomplished on the cross and through his resurrection truly did change everything. We now know our destiny, and that is to be with Christ forever. However, all right, this is a big however, however, Christ has not returned. And followers of Jesus have been waiting for a really long time for that to happen. We know what the end will be like, and it is beautiful and right and good, but we are not there yet. And so we must wait. We're living in what scholars have called the already, not yet. So Christ has already defeated death and darkness, but his work is not yet finished. And we're living in this time of overlap. And Paul understood this well. The new age has been ushered in, right? But the old age still remains and still opposes life and goodness. I want to show you an image that I drew a while back, and it might be a little hard to see, but hopefully you can see at least the big boxes. And so you have the old age dominated by death, all right? Violence, death, sin, strife, poverty, evil, all of that. 
Then you have the new age that is ushered in with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And and that is dominated by life, peace, love, justice, equity, equality, friendship, righteousness, goodness. And, And so what happened is we are living in this time of overlap. This is what the Bible teaches. And we can call this the church age or the already not yet. And we're living in this time of overlap where the old age still exists. It doesn't have ultimate power. The new age has been ushered in and we can experience a lot of that goodness, but there's a tension that we're living in. Do y'all feel that tension? Do y'all feel it? I feel it. We are living in this tension. We can experience the goodness of Jesus in the new age right now in this life. And, And I do on a regular basis experience joy and hope and happiness and friendship and goodness in life. And I see justice come. I see a peace and togetherness and unity happen. But this life is also really hard. The old age is still wreaking havoc and refuses to back down. As I said earlier, living in this world is really hard right now. I want to share a powerful insight um, from uh, an incredible thinker and author named Parker Palmer. Has anyone ever read Parker Palmer before? He's just so brilliant. Let Your Life Speak is a book that we've gone through with some of our staff at the church. Um, But my dad this week sent me a quote from Parker Palmer, and and he's talking about democracy in in the quote. And and, and my dad shared it as the election results for being tallied just as an encouragement to me, uh, because he knew I was probably just really in the thick of it, you know. And in this quote, Parker Palmer is talking about the commitment to democracy and equality and justice. And I think his insights actually really relate to what we're facing as followers of Jesus right now. And it's so brilliant. I want to share it with you. And it's really given me a framework to think about where we're at right now. So so listen to this carefully. Of all the tensions we must hold in personal and political life, perhaps the most fundamental and most challenging is standing and acting with hope in the tragic gap. On one side of the gap, we see the hard realities of the world, realities that can crush our spirits and defeat our hopes. On the other side of that gap, we see real world possibilities. Life as we know it, life as we know it could be because we have seen it that way. I love that quote, so I encourage you all to go back and read that again later, but I want to talk about what is sticking out to me. He says, do we have the courage? Do we have the courage to continue to stand and act in the tragic gap? And this tragic gap is the gap between the hard realities around us and what we know to be possible among us. Jesus made it clear that he is returning but he also made it clear that we have to get to work while we wait. We're not supposed to sit on our hands and just kind of wait for Jesus to come back and fix everything. No, we sow the seeds of the kingdom of God now while we wait for him to return. What I talked about before, Brueggemann says that we are awed to heaven, but rooted in earth, right? We sow the seeds of the kingdom of God now while we wait for Christ to return. And this gap, this time in between, this church age, it's often full of goodness and love, but it's also very difficult. To me, it often feels like a tragic gap, and it's tempting to give up. We either uh, often will slip into cynicism And many folks just adopt the ways of death and greed and hate and violence. They're like, well, the world operates this way. We're going to do it too. We'll be just like the rest of the world. Perhaps we may grow apathetic and and just so cynical that we lose hope of anything good ever happening. Or maybe we slip into idealism and escapism and we just pretend like everything is just fine. I agree with Parker Palmer that we must have the courage to stand and act in the tragic gap. The prophets and saints who have come before us, they stood and acted in the tragic gap, and that's how they were able to work with the Spirit to effect change. 
You see, the prophets criticized, but they also energized. They were willing to look wide-eyed directly into the face of the suffering and death and violence, and they spoke truth about the harsh reality. They didn't look away, even though it's tempting to look away and ignore it. They dealt with it. They spoke truth about it. But they also inspired hope around a vision of a different way, and they actively worked to bring that vision into reality. My friend Dustin, uh, I was texting with him this week about uh, some of these thoughts, and, and he shared with me an object lesson that he used when he was an organizer. And what they would do is they'd take a rubber band, all right, and they would hold it uh, between their fingers, all right, like this. And they would say that one finger here is the world as it is, and then the other finger is the world as it should be. And the further apart they are, right, the greater the tension in the rubber band. And many folks want to avoid the tension, so they just stop working for the world as it should be, right? They slip maybe into cynicism or escapism. But if we are going to follow Jesus, if we're going to stand and act in the gap, then we have to live in that tension. And my hope is that embrace continues to stand in the tragic gap, that we don't allow fear to scare us into avoiding the tension. You know, like I said earlier, the election result from this week certainly brought relief to many people who were rightly concerned and afraid of the destructive, divisive, and dangerous politics of our current administration. For example, I am grateful that my immigrant friends who are covered under DACA, they're likely not going to have to stress so much about the possibility of being deported and denied that status. What a relief for them. I'm celebrating with them because they feel that burden releasing off their shoulders. There are so many other examples. However, I will say that there is still so much work left to be done. The powerful are still going to take advantage of the weak. The violence is not going to go away. Racism has not been eradicated. The vulnerable will still be mistreated. The American empire is still going to deal in death and violence and greed. But Jesus has given us a vision. He's given us a glimpse of what life under his rule and reign can look like. And, and we don't just sit around and wait until he comes back. But we must work alongside the Holy Spirit, sowing seeds of the kingdom of God in our communities. What we can do, we can love God and we can love others knowing full well that God loves us. We can stand and act in the tragic gap, working and waiting for the beloved community that Jesus initiated so long ago. You know, guys, we've got each other. We've got Jesus. We've got the Holy Spirit. We've got God, our heavenly Father and Mother. We've got the eternal hope, right? Eternal hope, knowing that we're going to live with each other and we're going to live with God forever. So don't be afraid of the tension, but be courageous in the strength of our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.